turn to Acts 15.11. We're back in Acts. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was wondering, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was wondering, hey, what am I going to preach on now that I'm done with the circumcision stuff? And, and uh, there was a Jerusalem council, remember, uh, back in Acts 15. And uh, one of the the, the sects, the Judaizer sects, uh, the, the religious sects, the pharisaical sect, told the, um, the new Gentile believers, hey, unless you're circumcised, you're not saved. And uh, Paul and Barnabas got all up in arms. Hey, no, it's by grace you're saved. And they said, we're going to take this to the Jerusalem council. We're going to start, we're going to take this to the apostles and we're going to check this thing out. We're going to see what they have to say about this. And so Peter gave a testimony, James gave a testimony, and they came to the conclusion in, in the testimony, Peter finished off the, the testimony in Acts 15, 11, saying, no, we believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. And so he's talking about the Jews, hey, we, we're saved by the same grace you are. And it has nothing to do with circumcision, uncircumcision works, or anything, the law, or anything like that. It has to do with God's grace, God's work on the cross for us. Jesus fulfilled the law. And Jesus took our sins upon him on the cross, and because of that, we're saved. Not because of being circumcised or following the law or anything like that. Um, let's turn to Acts 16, 6, and uh, this is back uh, on where we left off, um, where Paul and Barnabas, and Paul actually starts going back out on his journeys. Without mercy and grace and forgiveness, we're doomed. <laughs> we're just doomed. Uh, God made a way um, in his mercy to span the gap of God's holiness and our unholiness and our sinfulness through the Son of Jesus Christ. It's a procedure done to us that has permanent results. You know, one commentator said, uh, responded to Ephesians 1, where it talks about, you know, our salvation and, and uh, that we're elected. And he, he said that since it is not by good works that salvation is achieved, it isn't by bad works that salvation can be lost in regard to the last point that we talked about. Circumcision is irreversible. No, this doesn't mean that circumcision of the heart is without effect, though. Um, the, the ground that produces, produces thistles, it's going to be burned. Um, but we're confident of better things in our case, in your case, things that accompany salvation. So there's, there's things that accompany salvation, but even then, it, it's, it's, it's done to us, not by us. Uh, we just get to participate in the Holy Spirit's work through our lives. And, and again, the seal of the Holy Spirit... Is, is the imprint and the image of Jesus Christ as our seal. He, he carries with it the imprint of the king. And there is only one person that can break that seal, and that's Jesus Christ. And we're being made holy. We're being made holy. We're being sanctified until Jesus Christ is formed in us, as, uh, as the Bible continually says, and, and his image is what we were created to be in the beginning with. We were created in God's image. And so it's being restored. We've been, it's been redeemed and bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In the Roman culture also, the family could disown their children born to them. But uh, if they adopted a child, they couldn't disown them. So just, uh, just a part of uh, the, the, the culture back there as they bring in you know, we're adopted children of God. He has adopted us into his family. And, uh, and praise God, he's, he's not going to throw us away. He's going to stay with us and stick with us. Um, by the way, talking about uh, being born, um, uh, Dan and Diane had a new grandkid. So uh, I, I forgot to post that in the bulletin. So uh, you go ahead and talk, talk to him. He's... He forgot his phone at home, so he doesn't have any pictures to share. But uh, next, next week, next week. So, all right. But anyways, preaching, preaching on circumcision of the heart has turned out to be kind of exciting and challenging. Uh, 
and uh, it caused me to really examine my heart to see, hey, are, am I circumcised of the heart? Um, and uh, check to see my inner motives, why I do the things I do. Um, do I live by faith? Uh, is, is Jesus in me? And uh, I trust that God spoke to you as well. Are you circumcised in the heart? Um, if we, sorry for I put the us there, grammatical error. If we are circumcised of the heart, God has a special plan for us and will give us strength and wisdom to follow it. God has gifted us to be an integral part of the body of Christ. God does not always ask us to do the things that we want to do. God does not always ask the things that we're comfortable with doing. And finally, God does not always ask us to do some things that we're capable of doing. But God will have us do some things as part of the body of Christ. And, and as many members one of another, differing, having gifts differing according to the grace that's given unto us, we need to, as a body, accept one another. You know, even the weird pastor, okay? Um, <laughs> just, I'm part of this body too, okay? Uh, but, but thank you, thank you. I, I do feel accepted. But uh, we're, we're one integral parts of, of this body, and it's incredible when, it, when, when, when the love binds us together and we can work together and do so many wonderful things in, in God's body and God's church. Uh, I love it. Um, God will have something to do. And I hope that as, as Paul's Macedonian call gives us a way to find out what God wants us to do and how to respond to that. And I, like I said in, the, in that passage, God may not give us things that we want to do, okay? But that doesn't mean that God ain't going to change our want, okay? Oh, no, never. And then all of a sudden, God may change our heart and says, oh, I can't think of anything better to do. I want to do this. And uh, it, it's, it's crazy how God, God does that. And just coincidentally, um, last week, we had Aaron come in here and uh, share his, his intense mission that's coming up. You know, God has used them so much in their previous mi mission, you know, bringing Bibles to, to people that, that need them and desire them so much. And then I'm anticipating so much great things that as God continues to lead, direct, and guide them in, in a place, you know, where, hey, these people that, that, that don't even have a written language, that don't even know Jesus, uh, can hear God's word. And, and he threw out a number, like a billion people, okay, out of 7.5 billion people in this world, a billion people haven't heard about Jesus. They haven't heard Jesus in their native tongue and, 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 and talk about it. That's a lot of people, a billion, a billion. And, and there was, he talked about a, a mission imbalance, right? What is it? You guys remember that? 99% of mission funding in this world, on the average, goes to missions that have already heard about Jesus. And 1% go to reach the billion that are still never heard about Jesus. And he put them in two categories, Tim Timothy missions and Pauline missions. Timothy missions are like when Paul sends Timothy, go to this church, this established church, and I want you to lead and direct it. It's important. It's really important to, to, to lead those established churches. And uh, then there's the Pauline churches where Paul says, I am going to go somewhere where nobody's gone before. And, uh, and uh, on an average, 1%. And, and one of the things I like, have you guys looked at that mission it's display that we got out there right next to the thing. It's amazing. Uh, Tink is not here today, but uh, it, it's, it's neat. And it's also nice to know that we're supporting two missionaries that are going into restricted areas. You know, both, both those missionaries, when, when we post anything about them, their faces are, the, the faces of their converts are blacked out or anything, if they send newsletters or anything, because, because th their missions can't be compromised. And so... Uh, just wanted to, to say, hey, maybe we're not a part of the great imbalance so far. And then uh, we also have Ben and Charity. They went to Thailand. They set up a church kind of, you know, out in the middle of nowhere where they haven't heard about Jesus. And they set up a church and uh, let that church, now that church is running. And they're just kind of operating on, uh, if, if on a need-to-know basis as a support group, not as 
hey, uh, the church is going to look to them to lead their church. No, they're leading it on their own, and they're sending out missionaries. So um, just, just some ideas and that, about our missionaries. And, of course, Sean and Christina, they go to a, a place that, that was previously communist, and uh, 1% of the country is, is, is evangelical Christian or less. And so uh, there's lots of people out there that still need to know about Jesus and to be ministered to. Um, and again, going back to, uh, to Slovenia area, this is kind of where Paul was being a missionary to. Um, following on the heels of the circumcision decision, Paul first goes to the cities where he'd already preached with the decisions of the Jerusalem Council, and then he continues his second missionary journey to new areas, and it starts with roadblocks. So um, Paul, on his first missionary journey, what's see. Paul's first missionary blue, just goes up there, yeah, something like that. <laughs> and then, then, his, then his second missionary journey, which is orange, he goes from the Jerusalem Council, and he goes back, backtracks to where he had already gone, and then we're right about, let's see, yeah, right about here, he's going into Asia, and he's in Mysia, and uh, then he gets his dream. Okay, here we are, um, Acts. 16, 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Ferga and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. While they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of the Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia, went down to Troas, and during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 9, 16. You know, God has a way of making his mission clear to us or his will clear to us. You know, of course, we have his word that gives us the structure and the building blocks for living godly lives and, and relationships, but he also, he also has got a plan for us, each of us. You know, there's many options out there within the perimeters of the law and love, <clears throat> but there is also a personal plan that God has laid out specifically for us, and God has orchestrated for you to be somewhere, to do something that brings about his eternal purposes. And if God is compelling you to bring about his glory to a special someone in a certain place at a specific time, you know, God's thoughts of you are more than the grains of sand. He's got a purpose and a plan for you. Um, God speaks in many ways besides through his awesome word. To Joseph, dreams. To Moses, a burning bush. And face to face. To Samuel, a voice in the night. And to Saul, a vision. And Balaam, he's the kind of guy I identify with, you know, a talking donkey. <laughs> no. <laughs> what is God trying to get across to us? How is God trying to get it across? You know, it may be a still small voice. It may be the encouragement of a trusted friend. One of the things, one of the key elements that I think God says, this is what you're going to do, is when it comes out of our mouth, I am never going to do this. God, I'll do anything for you but this, okay? Okay? And that's God saying, here's your sign, <laughs> okay? It's time to change your desires. I don't know. I, it, it, just, it just seems like, I'll never go to Africa. Okay, say that, okay? See what God can do. Um, it, it, I, it's impossible for me to do. That's another one. If you ever say, it's impossible, there's no way I could ever do that, okay? I could never teach buccaneer kids, all right? Okay? If it's impossible, yeah. God's talking to you. He's going to tell you to do something. Um, he's going to change your desire, and also he's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the wisdom. He's going to give you, he's going to equip you, and, and it's going to be that way, okay? So, it may be encouragement from a trusted friend. There may be a burning desire from a deep within that we just have to accomplish it. Or God may even use that stubborn 
And I'm going to use not the King James Version, but the NIV Version, uh, that stubborn word donkey, okay, to give, us, to give his message across to us. What if we miss the call? You know, what, what, if, what if you hear the call but, but think, not me, not me, you know? I could never do something like that. What if you hear the call and think, no way for me, but still trust God to work through you anyway? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give God, I'm going to let it. I'm going to let God try to take over. God has a plan for you. Look for what he's doing. Be sensitive to the roadblocks and build a vision in God's will. Get ready at once. Let's go. Let's go. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, Yet, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging a trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Let's turn to Jonah. Jonah, you're, you're part of God's wonderful plan. Uh, do you ever wonder what you're doing here, all right? Something like this, right, right there. What are we doing here? Um, some people, you know, say, where do you live? And some of my, some, I was just talking to a couple of missionaries. We're going to have a couple of missionaries uh, that are coming to this area in the, in the middle, right, right here. One, one's Joel. He's going to go to Cope. He's going to go there. They're coming like like Tuesday and Wednesday, and they're going to help out with Buccaneers. Um, one's, one was raised in Brazil as a missionary child. The other one is, uh, I don't know, going to Africa somewhere. This one's going to Paraguay. I'll find out. But the, he's going to come uh, dis, November 10. They're going to come to Buccaneers like November 6. And they asked me, hey, where is your church? I says, okay, it's in the middle of, <laughs> what's that? Somewhere, okay. <laughs> um, I said, and I, I kind of said that if you go, if you go south, you got to go about five miles to the first residence. If you go, if you go west, you got to go like eight miles to the first residence. North, five miles to the first resident. And, and then I got, I got a neighbor. I got a close neighbor. He's only a quarter mile away to the east. And and they said, whoa. <laughs> I thought I was going in the middle. But anyways, one of the things, one of my friends here, he, he lives, uh, he's a running friend, and we, we interact a lot, and um, he lives in between Idalia and, uh, and Joe's or something like that, and he, 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 he goes on runs, and he talks about this, but every time he says where he lives, he says, I live in the middle of everywhere. I live in the middle of everywhere. What, what is God's purpose for us out in the middle of everywhere? Um, why are we here? And just like the, the Big Bang Theory that cannot reasonably explain the universe and how life began by chance and by accident and when everything's like a perfect order, like with perfect design, you, <laughs> you're here for a specific purpose. Every single one of you, you you're here because God has placed you here. And <coughs> there, is, there is something inside of you connected to this body of Christ that is doing something in God's perfect will. And it's amazing. You're a part of God's wonderful design. You as a Christian have an important function in God's body, time and eternity. Okay? We're in the middle of everywhere. In the middle of everywhere. Here and in the middle of everywhere. In time, space, time, continuum, everything. God has a purpose for all of us, and it's huge. You're not a nobody. Well, <laughs> we're, I'm just a nobody, right? Telling everybody about something. But, but, but we're, we're not a nobody to God. We're a nobody to, to this world sometimes. But we can still tell people about Jesus 
Maybe you're sitting here today and you know what God wants you to do. God's whispered it to you with a still small voice. God has confirmed it with his words, friends that have encouraged you, circumstances, or even the gift that God has blessed you with. What are your options? Paul talks about two options, voluntarily or involuntary. Jonah is a great example of involuntary. All right. Jonah 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break it up. And then we're going to go to Jonah 4. I know most, most, most of you know the story of Jonah. Uh, Jonah and the big fish. Um, it, it, just take your time to read that again. But Jonah had two options, okay? God says, okay, in a still small voice, or however God talked to Jonah, go to Nineveh, that place, that, that nasty place that, that, that is before me. And Jonah says, nah. And, uh, and, and I don't think it was out of fear. Jonah wasn't scared to go to Nineveh. It was out of disgust. Jonah says, if I go to that place, that Nineveh place, and tell them that you're going to judge them, you know, I think they're going to turn. And they're not going to get what they deserved, okay? Now, that's not a very good missionary, right? He doesn't have a heart for missions. He said, I don't want to tell them because I want them to burn it out, all right? And that's why he really didn't want to go. So anyways, he goes, no, God, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to go to Tarshish. I'm going to do my own thing. And of course, you know the story. Jonah Jonah gets on the ship, the ship gets in a storm, and pretty soon Jonah's sleeping in the bottom of the thing, ha, got out of it. And, and, then, uh, and then, then pretty soon he gets woken up by the crew, and they says, hey, why are you sleeping? Don't you know we're all going to die? And, uh, and Jonah says, oh, yeah, I'm running away from God. That's why this is all happening. And they cast lots, and it fell on Jonah. And Jonah says, they said, what are we going to do? And uh, Jonah says, just throw me overboard. Just throw me overboard. End it right there. And... Uh, at least, at least Nineveh is going to do, go burn an owl, and I'll go drown in the ocean. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> that, that wasn't the end. Jonah gets swallowed up by a great fish. He prays inside the fish, and, and he, he, his heart kind of changes. Okay, God, I'll do it, you know, or something like that. And, and the fish spits him out on the shore. And now, now Jonah is really going to make an, issue, uh, an impact in in, uh, in Nineveh. Okay. Jonah was not pleased. Okay. The city of Nineveh had 40 days before God would destroy him. That was basically Jonah's mission. You're all going to die. 40, you got 40 days. 40 days, God's going to destroy you. That was Jonah's message of doom and gloom for them. But the whole city, it was a huge city. It took three days just to cross and walk across it. The whole city repented, including the king. Success! Now, if Jonah had gone voluntarily to begin with, the people probably would have said, oh, there's just some street preacher holding a sign, you know. You're all going to doom and gloom and, and, and perish. But no, now, now this guy that gets spit out and half-digested is talking, you know, people are going to pay attention, right? And, and through all that, the whole city of Nineveh repents. And then God relents. So, okay, since you repented, I'm not going to judge you in 40 days. And boy, Jonah was ticked. In Jonah 5, I mean Jonah 4, verse 1, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. And he prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents 
from slending calamity. That's our message. That's our message. A message to the immigrants, a message to, to the Taliban, a message to China, a message to whoever is out there. That God is slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And not only that, he doesn't just relent from that. He came down here himself and took our calamity upon himself and died on that cross. Let's turn to Philippians 1.15. Jonah's reluctance to do what God wanted him to do did not get Jonah out of doing it. When Jonah was thrown overboard, God did not scratch Jonah from the list and look for another prophet to go to Nineveh. Jonah was the man chosen for the job, and he completed what God wanted him to do in a miserable way. You know, God has a specific plan for us to fill. God is a God of order. God has probably made at least the next move or the non-move clear to us. You know, he may have shut the door and given a new vision. Are we going to embrace this vision or are we going to run from it? How we react to God's call is up to us. You know, God will accomplish his purpose in us, whether our heart is hard and driven by selfish motives or whether our heart is cut deep with the desires and the motivations of God's love. I like, I like how Paul says this, uh, you know, as we were reading uh, about involuntary, involuntary in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul goes on to say, he says, but Christ's love compels us. Christ's love compels us. I have a burning desire. I, I, can't, I can't not speak. God has a specific purpose for us to fill. Are we going to embrace this vision or are we going to run from it? How we react to God's will to God's call is up to us. God will accomplish his purpose in us, whether our heart is hard and driven by selfish motives or whether our heart is cut deep with the desires and motives of God's love. You know, it's amazing how God uses people like Jonah, Balaam, or even Pharaoh to accomplish his will in spite of their hard hearts. You know, I've heard it said that married men live longer. You know, some people say it, only seems longer. <laughs> what, what does it mean to live a long life? Okay? The Bible says that the children that honor their parents would live along on the earth. It's the first commandment with promise. What does it long life entail? You know, some, some people try to get through life. Others live life. There are those that are going through life saying, I can't wait till Friday. I can't wait till I'm done with school. Uh, I can't wait till vacation. I can't wait to move out of the house. I, I can't wait to retire. And then these people look back on their lives and they say, hey, man, why wasn't I living out the can't waits? You know, they may have had a miserable time waiting for life to be over, but they made it through. Ha! <laughs> God wants you to live life full by honoring God with your life and gladly, voluntarily doing what he wants you to do. Your days will be long and full. You know, we will have an abundant life. You know, last Sunday we were practicing as a worship team. And uh, someone mentioned, you know, I wish fall would get here. And uh, Becky was up here, and to my surprise, she says, I'm learning to brace all the seasons. You know, even winter. Even winter. I don't have many winters left. <laughs> Every day is a gift. <laughs> Amen, Becky. Yeah. Live for his glory. We don't have much time left. This life is so temporary. This is such a short, dinky, little speck of time blip on the scale of eternity. And, and still, still, 
you know, I can't wait to get there, Lord. You know, I, no, I want to live life. I'm, I'm live compelled. I want to live a full life. I want to live eternity down here for Jesus. I can't believe how much longer life, the week seems when I'm busy doing what God wants me to do. And, and I'm going, you know, just, just last, last Sunday seems like, like a year ago. Seriously. Uh, just because of all the activities and pl- stuff happening in there. You know, I, it seemed like a year ago when Becky said that. I've been a couple winners already. Um, but uh, live for his glory. You know, live in love. And you can look back on your life and see that you live life for the fullest. You know, God has a purpose for you. And God has a plan for you. You will fulfill it with the attitude and motivations that accomplish that plan. It's up to us for those attitudes. Like we talked earlier about doing God's will voluntarily or involuntarily. But even doing God's will voluntarily can end up miserable if driven with the wrong motives. Okay? Paul chose to give the gospel free of charge. And it was actively filled with joy. (laughs) Paul just, ah. You are my joy, my crown, Paul said. You know, it wasn't like Paul was sitting there, oh man, I got to go to these stinky, ugly Gentiles and, and tell them about him. You know, he was called to the Gentiles, you know, just like Jonah was called to Nineveh. And he could have done it, but, but I'm being compelled, I'm being forced, I'm being involuntary, whether I do it voluntarily. But no, no, Paul was excited about it. He, he, you are my joy, my crown, he says to, to Thessalonians. Um, He was doing it. God wants them to do. But Paul also noticed that there were people doing things and doing ministry work for the wrong motives. They were doing it. They were doing it voluntarily. But it can easily be harnessed for a personal agenda. Okay? I like how Aaron last week addressed the agenda or the idea that some missionaries go for a novel experience. Okay? This will be a great vacation experience and an adventure to enjoy. You know, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's, let's go to this, 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 this tropical paradise place and talk to these people and, and, and just spend the rest of our lives, you know, kicking back and, and enjoying the tropical paradise. You know, and, but he, he says that, that purposely um, the mission that he's with holds him accountable. To about, to about 40 hours a week of language study, culture study, everything like that. He says, we're not on vacation. We want to do what we want to do. God's given us the desires, but we're, 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 we're going to do it because Christ's love compels us, not because my selfish desires for a vacation compels me. All right? Not because I, I want everybody to, to look and say, oh, you're a hero right? He's doing it because he loves the people that he's going there, and he loves his God that he's telling the message to. Um, We may be voluntarily doing exactly what God has planned for us to do, but motivated by envy, rivalry, or selfish ambition. And in Philippians 1, starting with verse 15, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that every, in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. You know, Paul, Jonah, uh, Paul would have saw Jonah and said, look at his motives, man, they suck. <laughs> ah, but look what happened to Nineveh. God used the bad motives of Jonah to reach a whole city for Christ. And he says, whether bad motives or good motives, I praise God that his message is being preached. You know, we can try to avoid God's will for us and still end up doing it involuntarily. We can do God's will out of rivalry, envy, or some sort of personal gain, popularity, or desire for an exciting adventure. God will still get the glory through us, despite our motives. But who wants to end up miserable like like Jonah? Ah. Ah. You know, 
that's, that's after the plant withers that grew and he shaded them and stuff like that. And, and God sent a worm to cut it off. And, and Jonah said, man, I just want to die. I just want to die. And God kind of sets him straight. Who wants to end up all bitter and angry? Like we alluded to a few weeks ago, some also receive the reward in full down here. You know, when our building material is wood, straw, hay, or stubble, you know? That's what the Pharisees did it for. Jesus said, Jesus says, hey, you know, they got to the Pharisee that, that had the, the, the phylacteries of all the prayers that he does, and he has all the badges of honor and all that stuff, and he, he's, he's just in the, in the temple, man, I think I'm so righteous, and I'm not like that poor young tax collector or sinner down in the corner, man, I'm, I'm so good. And Jesus says, you, you get to heaven, boy, you, ha, I don't know if you get to heaven. You're not going to have anything because you got every reward down there, all the glory and honor and whatever you wanted down there. Uh, um, Paul is still excited about that the gospel is preached. The Ninevites that repented were still blessed, and they were moved to repentance. I'm learning to embrace all the seasons. We can embrace every task, mission, cookie baking, gift giving, encouragement, sending, prayer warrior sending, worship leading, hospitality bringing, prophecy sharing, good news proclaiming, you know, the list goes on. There's so many things that, ha that happen as the, in this body of Christ that, that I, I, you know, it, it's amazing. Something comes up and all of a sudden things come together. I mean, I just, all I got to do is put it on, on the calendar and all of a sudden it gets done. Because God has got some of you connected to him in that ministry. It's just amazing to see it all come together, how this body works. Music, cookies, food, funerals, you know, messages. Uh, it's just amazing how it all comes together in the body of Christ. Missions. The latter do so in love. You know, we can see God's plan for us. Embrace your Macedonian call. Seek God's glory as you enter your Nineveh, Thailand, the Philippines, Slovenia, Laos, China, South Central America, or, or Anton with love. Peace, joy, each and every day. Choose life, abundant life, where God has us or he sends us to do the things that he'd planned for us to do. Let's pray. Lord God, we just come to you today. And, and Lord, thanks for watching after us. Lord, we all like sheep have gone astray and astray and astray and astray. And, but Lord, you've you got your rod and your staff and they comfort us. Lord, you lead us by the still waters. You lead us out into green pastures and, and you guide us through the dark and dreary valleys. Lord, I just thank you for leading each and every one of us and as each one of us individuals. You know, we're not a nobody to you. But if we think we're a nobody, telling everybody about that somebody that saved our soul, Lord, you get the glory because it is your strength, your love that compels us and your will that brings us to whatever we do for your glory. Lord, help us to see and listen to your call, wherever it is. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand. <clears throat>